morning. You may have noticed that the choir looks different than sometimes. <laughs> we are delighted to have the Hendricks Chapel Choir with us this morning, and delighted to have our own bell choir with us this morning, as well as a guest preacher, Reverend Colleen Prininger, who is the chaplain at Hendricks Chapel uh, at Syracuse University. Part of the reason for doing this is that the choir wanted to say thank you, especially to our bell choir, who is a part of their uh, Christmas holidays at Hendrix concert. And um, those of us who were lucky enough to get to go to that know how wonderful that was, and we're excited to be able to have a little bit of that excitement here with us this morning. So welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you for joining with us in this time of worship. Let us join together in the call to worship. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to give your lives to God. This is the worship that God desires. We come together to worship God, offering our true selves to God, all that we are and all that we're not. By God's mercy, we are not conformed or constrained by the patterns of this world or what has been in the past. Praise God. By God's mercy, may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds in this time of worship. Let us pray. Source of wisdom, we praise your abiding guidance. For you sent Jesus to teach us your way of self-giving love. Thank you, Lord, for the abilities and responsibilities you have given us. By your Holy Spirit, may we learn to live as Jesus did, loving you continually with every action of our daily life, that your reign might come as your will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 2004 in the Faith We Sing book, Praise the Source of Faith and Learning. You may be seated. 
I would like to invite any children who are here to come forward for a time with Reverend Prininger. And she has a child of her own, so she should be good at this. Mm, no pressure. Hey, everybody. Come on in. Come on in, come in, come in. Hi, 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 hi. Hello? Hello, 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 hello. Oh, are you coming too? Awesome. My name is Colleen, and I am a pastor, and I'm really happy to be with you today. And I came this morning, when I woke up this morning, I was not at my house. I was at a place which is my very favorite place in the whole wide world, and that is Casawasco. Has anyone ever been to Casawasco before? No? Has anyone out there been to Casawasco before? No. So Casawasco is a place where um, maybe some of the people out there, maybe you have brothers and sisters that go to summer camp. Have you ever heard of summer camp before? It's where in the summer time you go and you stay for like a week and you learn about God and you do all sorts of fun stuff like swimming. Does anyone like swimming here? Yeah? Ooh, me too. And uh, blobbing and um, it's where you like jump off a thing when you're a little bit bigger and you like jump on this big giant huge pillow that's like almost as big as this whole church and then you sit on the end and someone else jumps and they get catapulted into the water. Does that sound fun? <laughs> yeah. It's... Well, maybe, it depends, right? <laughs> so at Casawasco, um, usually you go in the summer, right? But some of, you might know them, some of the youth, the older kids here, are actually there right now. And anybody have the time? What time is it? Like 9, 30, 5, 40? Right now, they are in church right now, but with a big band, with a Casawasco band, with like guitars, and like a big screen, kind of like those. And my husband, his name is Nick, He's preaching, and I'm sure he's doing it really good right now. Um, and they're there. They've been there. I've been hanging out with them all weekend. And we went to camp in the winter, and there's huge icicles and there's big snow. And it's really cool, and we've been learning about God and having all sorts of fun, like sledding. Has anyone ever sledded before? Yeah? We went sledding in this big hill, and it's really cool. So um, we've been saying a lot of things to them. Um, and the thing we say every morning, I'm going to teach you this, Okay. We say at camp, Casawasco, how do you feel? But I'm going to say Liverpool because that's where we are. So, so Liverpool, how do you feel? And then everyone responds really loud. We feel good. Oh, so good. And then they go like this. Ready? Ha, 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 ha. I was wondering, could you try that? Can you try that with me? Wait, wait. So when I say Liverpool. I'm going to say, Liverpool, how do you feel? And anyone who has been to Casawasco and has the ability to do it, you are free to join with us. Um, and you stand up on your feet and you say, we feel good, oh so good. And then the huzz, which is the favorite part. Ready? As loud as you can, you go, huh, 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 huh. Got it? Got it? Got it? <laughs> Quam, you got it? Quam, you got it? All right. All right. I'm sure that the Hendrick Chapel Choir will help you too, right? Yeah, okay, ready? <laughs> Liverpool, how do you feel? Stand up, stand up, stand up. We feel good. Oh, so warm. Ha, 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 ha. Great, wonderful. Be seated. Great. So, so, whenever you, and I'm sure at some point when you get a little bit, little bit older, you'll go to camp, and um, you will know exactly what they mean. So the first day they'll be like, and you will know it, okay? So one of the things that we've been telling um, the older kids from Liverpool and the rest of the kids that are there this, this weekend is this that I really want you to hear, and that is God loves you so much just as you are. So you were created by God, and God loves you, <laughs> Not because of what you do or what you're able to do or what grades you get or how fancy your clothes are. God loves you and accepts you just as you are. God thinks you are awesome and beautiful. And God wants you to be just you. Can you remember that? God loves you and accepts you and thinks you're awesome and beautiful just as you are. 
no matter what people say to you ever, even when we do stuff that's maybe not great, when we need forgiveness, no matter what, I want you to remember the thing that I've been telling the kids this weekend, and I'm telling you now, God loves you just, just the way you are, because you are amazing and awesome. Okay? Can you remember that for me? Forever and ever, will you remember that? When you are th these big kids like these, these and, and in college, will you remember that? That you are, you are just right, just the way you are, and God wants you to be just you, because God accepts you just as you are. Can you remember that? Okay. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for being so awesome and giving us faces like Cassie Wasco and people to love us. Remind us today that you created us and that you love and accept us just the way we are and that we have to just be ourselves because who we are is wonderful and beautiful and awesome. We ask all of this in your name, which is the name that loves everybody just as they are. Amen. One who opened my eyes to Jesus. In preparation for this message, as I look back over the life of my family, I see that we have been blessed by the lack of major bad events. There have been no life-threatening injuries, only several broken bones. No major traffic accidents, just a few minor ones. No stressful impacts in the workplace or in school. And only one life-threatening illness. That illness to my wife, Sharon, was what opened my eyes to see Jesus. She was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, bone marrow cancer. The treatment was long and arduous, and the cancer was finally overcome by a lengthy drug treatment, which in turn damaged her kidneys. During her last few years, her activities were severely limited by having to undergo dialysis several times a week, 
initially at the center in downtown Syracuse, and then at home. During her ordeal, she was comforted by prayer and managed to organize her life to continue working and participate in many activities, including remaining active working for the Methodist Conference and here in church. Sharon came from a religious family. Her father was a Methodist minister in central and western New York. I know she called upon Jesus many times, and that is what gave her the strength to continue to be as active as she was during her last years. Let us join together in the call to prayer, hymn number 453, verse 1, More Love to Thee, O Christ. Heavenly Father, you tell us to sing as we pray to you. From Exodus, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. From First Chronicles, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wonderful acts. Sing to the Lord, all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day. From the book of Psalms, sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. <coughs> Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. We are grateful for the opportunity to sing to you, Lord, and thankful for the many musicians and choirs we have in this church. And today we are extremely pleased to have the Hendricks Chapel Choir an organist Ann LeVar at our 9.30 service. During last fall, those of us in the Liverpool Community Chorus learned several new Christmas songs. During the rehearsals, we learned the notes, the words, the dynamics, and the timing. But it wasn't until I was on stage at the high school that I really heard the message of this song called My Grown-Up Christmas List. Do you remember me? I sat upon your knee. I wrote to you with childhood fantasies. Well, I'm all grown up now and still need help somehow. I'm not a child, but my heart still can dream. So here's my lifelong wish, my grown up Christmas list, not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart, that wars would never start, and time would heal all hearts, and everyone would have a friend, and right would always win, and love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. Please listen now to our individual prayers for our personal problems and concerns. Open our ears, minds, and hearts to the words of today's scripture and sermon. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Will the ushers please come forward? Almighty God, you continue to bless our lives in many intrinsic, intrinsic and intangible ways. Use our financial gifts to support mission and ministry so that we can see others blessed in tangible ways.
As we come back together, I want to again thank our Hendricks Chapel Choir and Reverend Prininger and our organist Annie and Peppy, and Peppy <laughs> for all of them being here this morning. We're very glad to have them. Our hymn will be number 100, God Whose Love is Reigning O'er Us, verses 1 and 6. Be seated. We have two scripture passages today. The first is Romans 12, chapters 1 and verses chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 from the message. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture sound around you, Always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Before we hear the second scripture, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a preface, uh, because it is actually an entire chapter of the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. And uh, those of you who have been with us this semester know that at Hendricks, um, this entire semester, we're guiding all of our worship and our Bible study by the book of Revelation. In the, in the fall semester, we did Genesis, remember? Yeah. <laughs> They're good. And now in the spring, we're doing Revelation, like an alpha and omega thing. Yeah, get it? Beginning and end? You don't look impressed. Anyway, <laughs> you're impressed. Oh, yeah. 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 It's because I feed you, right? <laughs> yeah. Chili this week. <laughs> if anyone wants to help me make chili on Tuesday, please give me a call. So, um, Revelation, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a preface because um, has anyone read the book of Revelation before or bits and pieces of it before? Yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah, it is. So uh, the fifth chapter, we, got, we, we have a lot of cosmic -y vision images going on, so I just want to give you a little bit of a framework so that you can really hear what we want you to hear today. Uh, the book of Revelation was written by a guy named John. Tradition tells us it's John the disciple. Uh, it's probably another guy named John, but either way, he's a Christian leader. And he's writing this as a letter while he is exiled on the island of Patmos. It's a small island off the coast of modern-day Turkey, 
where he's been exiled there by the Roman government. So he writes this as a letter to seven specific churches in Asia Minor, in, in modern day Turkey. And he writes it as an urging for them to not accommodate the culture that they're living in. He's writing it as an urging for them to hear something as Christians. Um, and that is his thesis. So despite all of the weirdness of a lot of the images that you'll hear today, and if you read it, it, it gets really weird at times, dragons and locusts and teeth and all sorts of things, but he has a thesis. And this is a thesis that I make uh, everyone at Hendrix every week recite uh, and repeat, which I'll make you do today. And I would also make you do it as well. And that thesis is, and I'm going to have you repeat after me, God is in control. God is in control. And Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord. And Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord. Oh, that's good. Y'all are good. You are good too. God is in control and Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord. This is the thesis of the book of Revelation. And so as you hear the fifth chapter read to you in all of its cosmic -y awesome eyes and horns and glory, I want you to have that thesis in the back of your mind so that you can really just hear it shining through. God is in control and Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord. From the New Revised Standard Version. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb, standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God, saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels <clears throat> surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Oh, sisters, ain't you happy? Oh, sisters, ain't you happy? He followers of the Lamb. Oh, sisters, ain't you happy? Oh, sisters, ain't you happy? He followers of the Lamb. 
I told the kids a little while ago, I woke up this morning in my favorite place ever, in the cabin at Casa Wasco. I love it there. I had the great honor and privilege of uh, being there the last two weekends, and actually I hung out with uh, lots of your kids uh, this past uh, weekend. They're there right now, um, still in worship. And we had such a great time. Solid youth retreat. We've been doing it at Casa Wasco for about five years. And my husband, Nick, and I, uh, Nick is the pastor at Emmanuel United Methodist Church in Camillus, uh, we have the honor and the privilege of being the speakers at Solid, um, and we have for the past five years. Um, the goal of Solid Youth Retreat is to, from Casa Wasco, those of you who are familiar with summer camp, uh, we said, why couldn't we structure something that looks a little bit like summer camp uh, for a youth retreat in the weekend, so we just get youth and their youth leaders and they come, and we do everything except be with the kids. So they get to just, the youth leaders just get to be with their youth and grow in relationship and we do worship for them. We do four worships uh, throughout the weekend. We feed them. We have lots of sledding and awesomeness. And the youth leaders just get to be with the kids. And it's so much fun. Um, so Nick and I have the privilege of crafting the worship times. And that's what we did this year. And um, our theme, we, each year we have a different theme based on what does it mean to have a solid faith. It's called Solid Youth Retreat. And this year we borrowed an image from Walter Brueggemann, a fantastic contemporary theologian. And that image that we borrowed is that of scripts. And we, the bottom line, the thesis of our weekend was having a solid faith means being willing to align your life with God's script. And so we posed it to the kids in this way, in dualistic terms, which is a little bit simplistic, but for, for the sake of our context, that what we did. And we borrowed this from Brueggemann. We said, there are two kinds of scripts that we are offered each day. God's script and the world's script. These scripts, and, and by script we mean anything that seeks to guide or determine or shape who we understand ourselves to be and who we understand other people to be. Anything that seeks to tell us uh, what we should think about or what we should say or how we should treat people who we perceive as different than us. Anything that tells us what we should buy or what it means to be a productive member of the community. We have God's script, God's intention and way of guiding us and shaping us through the community of faith and through scripture and the Holy Spirit. And then we have the world's script, anything in society or culture or nation that seeks to determine who we are and who we understand ourselves to be. We argued that these are two scripts that we are offered every day. And these are really two scripts that actually, in actuality, exist often simultaneously within us, that inform one another, these two narratives, and often are at odds with one another in our lives. Now, we chose this theme to offer to the youth of Upper New York because we thought that at this time in their lives, they are at a critical juncture where they are beginning to decide for themselves what forces are they are going to allow to guide their life. What voices are they going to listen to as they understand who they are and how they're going to relate to other people and how they're going to act in the world and what they're going to think about and who they're going to be. But this is not just a message for young people. This is a message that as Christians, we all need to hear. And so for that reason, I'm bringing it to, to you today as we brought it to our kids this weekend and last weekend, because I think it's a message that you need to hear and I need to hear. 
Now, unfortunately for me, and probably fortunately for you, we do not have time in this sermon spot to go through the four messages that we offered this weekend, although I assure you, they were awesome. <laughs> I'm going to go right to the heart of it today, our Saturday night message that we offered last night. And this message stands at the center of what it means to identify as a Christian and at the intersection of all we do and say as self-identifying Christians as we relate to the world around us. And it has to do with our worth as human beings. And it has to do with how we judge the worth of every other person that we interact with ever. And that is, our worth and everybody else's worth is determined solely by the unconditional love and grace of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. This is a message that we as Christians, we need to know it by heart. We need to know this truth in our bones. We need to eat, sleep, breathe this truth because it is the key to relating to ourselves and to others in the way that God intends, the way that Jesus taught, the way that God's script always reads. Our worth and everybody else's worth is determined solely by the unconditional love and grace of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. Knowing our worth, like in our bones knowing our worth, is a tricky thing. Because too many times either, way down deep in the depths of ourselves, we don't actually believe that we have inherent worth apart from anything else. Or, we believe that our worth comes by our own efforts, what we do. Both understandings can be really damaging, and both come from the societal and cultural expectations and pressures that we experience in our society. In other words, both come from the world's script. Everything we have been told since we have been born, especially those who have grown up here in America is that our worth comes from what we do. We are told directly and indirectly, especially as good Protestants with a good Protestant work ethic, right? We've been told that we are valued, our worth comes from what we do, what grades we get, what job we're able to get, what promotions we're able to achieve, how much money we make, what leadership positions we may hold in the church, how busy we are. We are a busy people. We are taught that we are only valuable, we are only worth something when we are hardworking and diligent and useful to other people or institutions or churches. And what happens when we cease to be useful? We're taught that that's where our worth comes from. And we believe it. And that's a lie. That is the world's script of worth. Our worth and everybody else's worth is determined solely by the unconditional love and grace of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. And that's really hard for us to believe, especially believe for real in our bones, because everything around us is telling us something else, even here in the church. But it's true. Our guiding scripture this morning comes from the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. Does anyone remember what the bottom line is? What the thesis for Revelation is? Wait, wait. We'll, we'll let them answer this. What is... Sovereign Lord, right? God is in control and Jesus Christ is Sovereign Lord. 
Although much of the book of the Revelation of Revelation is strange, and sometimes it's really confusing, and it is, this is the red thread, this thesis. It runs all the way through John's letter, begging us as his hearers to remember and to recognize the source of our worth, the source of worthiness, and that is Jesus Christ. Worth, John argues, originates with God and is made available to us and to all people. Not just people who you perceive are similar to you. All people through Jesus Christ. God is the origin of worth. Jesus is the source of worthiness. And we, as beloved creations, as children of God, receive our worth and worthiness solely from the origin and its source. We have worth, John argues, because we were created by the one from whom worth originates and is defined. We are worthy only because the grace of Jesus Christ makes us worthy. Nothing else, nothing else defines our worth. Nothing else makes us worthy. No matter who we are, no matter what we believe, no matter the color of our skin or the content of our creed or the gender of our spouse, our worth comes from God and God alone. And nothing, nothing can take that worth away from us. And we can see this imperative and we can see this movement just flow out of the text from Revelation 5. In the passage that we have before us that you heard just a moment ago, we view it through the eyes of the author, John. We see myriads and myriads of saints and heavenly creatures and John, our author, standing around the throne of God. They are waiting for something. They are waiting for the seals to be open on the scroll. Did you hear that image of the scroll? They're waiting for the seals of judgment to be opened to judge the inhabitants of the earth. The multitude crowding around the throne is waiting for justice. How long, O oh Lord? They are waiting for judgment. And as they wait, we see the multitude in their posture and in their location identify the source of power. What are they crowding around? Oh, 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 sorry. You have to answer back. What are they crowding around? The throne of God, right? They are crowding around the throne of God, identifying it as the source of power and of justice and of worth. And as they crowd around the throne and wait, the author John looks around and he begins to realize something. And what he begins to realize is that there is not a single person or heavenly being in this vast crowd that is worthy to do the thing that they're waiting for. There's not a single person or being in this crowd of their own power that is worthy to open the seals of judgment on the scroll. They are not able by their own power to do the justice required to heal the brokenness of the created order. No created being by their own power, is worthy apart from the love and grace of God. No one is worthy in this vast multitude, in this vision, by their own power, to open the seals of judgment on the scroll. They are not worthy. They are not able. So they crowd around the throne of God and they wait for something to happen. They wait for someone to define who they are and to empower them. In response to this realization, as he's standing in the crowd, that apart from God, none are worthy, 
John gives in to his anxiety and falls into a fit of hopelessness. And he begins to weep bitterly. And in this moment of hopelessness, one of the elders in the crowd speaks in to his hopelessness, speaking truth into John's own feeling of unworthiness and points John's attention to Jesus. Or in this vision, the symbol for Jesus. Does anyone remember what the symbol for Jesus is in this vision? The lamb. And not just any lamb. How is the lamb described? Yes, standing as if it had been slain, as if it had been slaughtered at the base of the throne of God. Now, isn't that strange? What a strange image for Jesus. What a strange image for power. Because what use on earth or in heaven is a slaughtered animal? I mean, other than eating, right? And that would be... We're not even going there. <laughs> what use is this image? What use is this symbol for those who are seeking power, who are seeking worth? What could this image, this lamb standing as if it has been slaughtered to define who we are? What chance does it have to hold up against what the world offers us? Money, power, privilege. What? But the crowd around the throne is keyed into God's script. And they see the lamb and they identify its power immediately. They are filled with hope as they turn their attention to Jesus at the foot of the throne of God and they sing. And they don't just sing any song, they sing a new song. They sing, you, Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered and by your blood you ransomed for God the saints from every tribe, every language, every people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on the earth. In this scene, the power of God is the source of all worth in the symbol of the one standing on the throne. And at the foot of the throne, we have the symbol of all worthiness, the lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. And the multitude, the representation of the entire created order, receives its identity and power directly from these two sources, through the worth of God and the worthiness of Jesus Christ. They are worthy only because Jesus is worthy. They, that is their identity. That is their power. And the same is true for us. It is really easy to live into the lie of what the world script tells us about worth and worthiness. It's easy for us to get caught up in the misconception that somehow, if only we do our best and we work hard enough, that somehow we can earn our standing in the community of faith, in the body of Christ, and in the eyes of God. But we can't. Because we can't earn our worth. Because it flows to us directly from the throne of God. And so I want to ask you this morning to be honest with yourself. What are you allowing to define your worth? Is it God? Or is it something else? Because I'm here to tell you today that you are loved and accepted just as you are because you are a beloved creation and child of God and that your worth is determined solely by that criteria and that your worthiness to do the work of the body of Christ, to do the justice and reconciliation that is required of us as Christians comes only from this source, from only from this power. But it doesn't stop there. And I really wish I could stop there, because you would like me better if I could. 
because it's not just how we understand our own worth, and that is important, because we can't relate to others as God intends until we know who we are. But it's also equally about how we judge the worth and worthiness of other people, especially those who we perceive are different than we are. I'm not talking just about Christians, folks. I'm talking about every human being on this earth. In John's vision, everyone wanted justice. Everyone was crowding around the throne of God waiting for judgment. But the only one in this vision could, that could do that was God. And the only one that was worthy to break the seals of judgment was the Lamb. Oh, how we want to sit in the judgment seat. I do. Oh, how we want to personally pry up those seals on the scroll of judgment and allow it to rain down on those with whom we disagree, on those whom we dehumanize by our practices, by the clothes we buy, by the way we treat people. So I'm gonna ask you one more question, and I hope you're brave enough to answer it in your heart. What are you allowing to determine and define the worthiness and worth of other people, especially those who look, live, love, behave, believe differently than you do? Are you allowing God's worth and Jesus' worthiness to flow from the throne of God into your heart and into the hearts of others? Are you allowing that to define how you relate to people who you perceive as different than you? Or are you seeking in your own self-righteousness to open the seals of judgment yourself? It's not enough to understand ourselves as Christians to be loved and accepted and forgiven and given worth and empowered to do the work of God through the worth and worthiness of God and Jesus Christ. If we are using that self-knowledge to judge and exclude other people, to legitimize things that are not legitimate, that are not in God's script, treating people in the ways that we do. So what script are you going to allow to guide your life? What script are you going to allow to win in this narrative that exists within? God's script? Or the world's script? It's your choice. You are a beloved creation of God, given worth and worthiness solely from the love and grace that flows from the throne of God. May you know that in your bones. May you recite that in your sleep. And may you allow that identity to inform every single thing you do, what you think, what you say, what you do. And may you be brave enough to extend the same unconditional love and grace that flows into our hearts from the throne of God into everyone you meet, especially those who you perceive as different than you are. Amen. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy are you. God of all creation, the one who sits on the throne, the one who stands as if slaughtered, thank you for reminding us of your love. Thank you for reminding us that we are beloved just as we are and that you accept us just as we are. Make us brave. Help us to have the courage to treat other people in the same way. And help us to have the courage to stand up of, to systems of injustice when we see them. 
and to repent and ask for forgiveness when we find ourselves in the midst of them. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God. Amen and amen. And as we worship, and in this spirit of hope, we join our voices together with the ancient prayer taught to us by the Lamb, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Please rise as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, number 505, verses 1, 3, and 4. Content, but never still. Go into this world knowing that the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb who was slain have called you worthy. And the Holy Spirit is your prompter. Follow God's script this week and always. Go in peace in the name of the one Jesus called Abba, Father. In the name of the one who called Jesus and calls you my beloved child in the name of the Holy Spirit, who calls to each of us, go in peace. Amen.
I'll tell Parsons. Too little, too late. <laughs>